And now on the line is Mara De, De Lacey, the clinical manager of Archelin and Ballymun. Mara, welcome to the program. Hello, Darren. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Mara, my colleague George Mulcahy did an interview with you last November on Near FM, and the podcast of that interview is still available on the Near FM podcasting page so we don't need to go through all of the same questions again to start off can you tell me if you have any news in arch Lynn since that last interview that you would like to maybe tell our listeners about well, i suppose the only news we have here since i was talking to george is that we have now a very active group on friday morning for family members who are affected by um as someone else is drinking. Uh, so we have some mums and we have some wives and we have some siblings who are concerned about their families drinking. And then this month we're launching a gambling awareness programme, which is uh, very much a new departure, but we thought we'd uh, seen a lot of people with scratch cards and were aware that there is a major problem with it. So we thought, okay, what we'll do is we will launch a pilot and see how that goes. So that's commencing towards the end of this month um, with six weeks of sort of education around it. And then for people who want support to stop an ongoing therapy group on a Tuesday evening here for us. It's great that you have a program now for problem gambling. We'll come back and talk about alcohol in a few minutes, but the problem of problem gambling has really grown in the last few years, hasn't it? It has. I mean, it was very interesting. I was talking to a local resident recently, and um, she was remarking on the fact that she's seeing sort of teenagers, and we're not sure age-wise, like she was sort of saying they could be 16, but they could be slightly older, outside uh, the sort of local uh, convenience stores with wads of scratch cards scratching away and then they obviously win something go back in and spend that money again on more scratch cards so you know what was I suppose uh, covert has become quite overt in that people are now noticing it going on around them I suppose you know we've all heard about the slot machine addiction and I've worked with people who have had serious addictions within the context of the bookies office and slot machines and casinos. But you now have the whole online, um, which is very, very difficult for family members to identify. So something is going on and money is disappearing, but people are not quite sure what it is. So a really difficult um situation uh, for families and a really difficult situation for the the problem gambler themselves because they don't really know where to turn to get help when things start to impact on them and they inevitably do impact on them quite severely. And it sends out an awful message, doesn't it? If you see all these uh, football teams, soccer teams in Ireland and England and Scotland sponsored by our uh, gambling companies, it sends out a terrible message, doesn't it? Do it certainly does. Like, I mean, I was actually horrified because that whole thing of this advertising and sponsorship really annoys me. I was... Uh, standing at a bus stop and there was a whole gang of school kids last week. It was just at the end of the school year. And I happened to glance at the poster and the the poster said, take your Guinness time. And I thought, oh my God, you know, why are we still doing this? Mm. Why is this still so much pushed in to people's um, faces? that it's a subliminal message that those kids will have picked up because they stand at that bus stop five days a week. Um, you know, it won't any longer be just take your time. It'll be, no, oh, take your Guinness time. And then mm. it'll be, um, I need to try that. I remember a problem drinker years ago saying to me that he had a relapse because he had spent his time driving from Selbridge 
behind uh, a number 67 bus, I think. And on the back of the bus, there was an ad for some sort of new drink. By the time he got into town, the only thing he could think of was having a taste of that new drink. So those messages do go in, I suppose. That's what I find. And just a bit about problem gambling. Something like 10 uh, soccer teams in the English Premier League are sponsored by gambling companies. That's unreal, I think, do you? Oh, yeah. Mm. But, I mean, I'm not surprised because uh, if you think about how much in this country, uh, you know, drink, the drink industry sponsors, you know, it's sort of not surprising that in Britain that uh, the gambling has uh, moved that out you know, into the sort of general consciousness in that way, I think it would be helpful if we could actually see it here more clearly. Mm. And we don't see it as clearly here. I've interviewed Barry Grant, the CEO of Problem Gambling Ireland, a few times. You would, I presume, support his work, would you, for there to be a gambling regulator in Ireland and legislation and more investment in services in general to deal with problem gambling, would you? Oh, I certainly would. I think it's a, I think it's a, a, a misery that is utterly and completely overlooked. Mm. A misery for the gambler and a misery for the gambler's family. Mm. Okay. You know, I think any sort of legislation that looks like... I was really heartened by the fact that uh, I think last week in Britain they opened a clinic for problem gambling in Leeds for adolescents. Mm. And that is an NHS, a National Health Service clinic for adolescents. And in some ways, adolescents have been trained into that whole gaming, gambling sort of uh, risk-taking mm. culture with the online games, etc. I think even children are being roped in now into the online gambling, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's becoming a really toxic and uh, and really secretive it's you know in a sense as uh, as uh, the local resident said to me the other day uh, you know it, it's by far the worst one because when people are a drinker they stagger they stir the slur the words uh, when somebody is on drugs they behave differently they're more agitated but the gambler you can't see mm. Okay, we'll just move on. We talk a bit about alcohol in Ireland. A great and historic thing that's happened in Ireland over the last nine months or so is that we now have a Public Health Alcohol Act. You were and are big supporters of this act coming in, are you? I am a big supporter of the act, but I have a little caveat about it. And my caveat or worry and concern is if we don't have services to help dependent drinkers, mm. you know, and the minimum price goes up, where does the money come for the dependent drinker? Okay. And how and where does the dependent drinker get help? You see, if somebody is dependent, are they going to uh, withhold money from the family so they can uh, buy their alcohol? And if they withhold money for the family, then what we're doing without services to help these people is we're increasing poverty. And the other aspect of that that I think is is concerning is that if people are dependent and they can't afford alcohol uh, and they withdraw suddenly, they are prone to have seizures. And if someone has a seizure, they then become yet again a burden on the health service. And at this time of year, I have worked in um, Bowland Hospital for a number of years uh, running an alcohol clinic. And at this time of year, when the sun is shining, I can guarantee that a good 80% of the people who will be down an accident and emergency are there because of drinking. And when you have that, okay, so if someone is a hazardous hazardous drinker or a harmful drinker, that's fine. The minimum pricing thing is really great and it stops them and the, the reports from Scotland are really good. But nobody is actually thinking of the dependent 
drinker and the dependent drinker will be prone to having a significant fallout and there will be significant fallout from the family. And I suppose that's, that, that's where I am um, caught both in favour of uh, the Public Health Alcohol Bill and questioning why the infrastructure to support such a bill isn't also there. I know your service, Notch, Lynn. I think you deal with the Beaumont Hospital and Matter Hospital or Catchment area, is it? Yeah, that's it. And but so, and how how are the services or the lack of services in the rest of Dublin or the rest of the country? Well, let's put it this way: there is no uh, specific alcohol services left. Uh, apart from us in North Dublin, Stanhope is uh, 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 historically uh, uh, an alcohol service, but it has now been a HSE service, but it's now been blended. Uh, and one of the difficulties is that when you blend services, if you've got clients who are uh, on um, opioid substitution uh, programs, and you have people who are struggling to maintain abstinence, it is a very inequitable situation. So it, it doesn't necessarily work. So we are very clearly just alcohol. Um, I don't think there's anything left in the south side. There used to be the Glen Abbey Centre in Tala, and that was made a drug service as well. And Bagot Street closed. So there's no HSC, so there's no free mm. service. Mm. I, you can see, however, an addiction counsellor within the HSC, but that's not really a, a service. It's individual work, which doesn't go into education or group work or anything like that. Good. And, like, what is the main thing stopping the r r rollout of more services? L lack of funding or is there a lack of staff as well or what's the story, do you know? I'd say it's... Uh... <laughs> I'd say it's exactly the same lack of interest as took it so long for the public health alcohol bill to go forward. Okay. Um, I think there's a lot of vested interests in alcohol, and uh, whereas the statement is constantly there isn't money, um, the money that we save if we have one client annually who would have been in Beaumont Hospital or the Martyr, it's a thousand euro a day, okay? Oh, yeah. And normally if someone goes in with sort of a seizure and a liver favor, pancreatitis, any of the above, they're normally there for 21 days. That's 21,000 euro, mm. okay? And um, if we had three like that, that's 50% of our budget, annual budget. But people are not actually looking at it like that. They're looking at it for a very point. Uh, you know, the hospitals are overstretched. The hospitals need the money as, a, as opposed to a proactive approach, which is, you know, give the hospitals an ability to detox people in an outpatient capacity and support organizations like ours that could be replicated on a very efficient and cost-effective basis in every community around Ireland. I mean, it, it is, uh, you haven't been here, Darren, no. but we operate out of three rooms. Okay, we deal with about 100 people a week. We run a group, uh, two groups on Monday, a group on Tuesday, a group on Wednesday, a group on Thursday, and two groups on Friday. So that's, what, eight groups a week? Uh, we have, see individual clients every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we can do that on 120,000, I mean, and you have today in Beaumont probably sitting on chairs, on trolleys, in bays, everything like that, probably 50, 60. If even 20 of them got here, it would be a huge saving for the hospitals and it would also be a huge saving in terms of additional costs of you know family distress 
partners on medication for their nerves, children failing in school because of family stressors, and all of the extending problems that come from having problem drinking or problem gambling in the home. Mm. Okay. Um, are, is there any, just to come towards the end of the interview, is there any ways our uh, listeners can support you in your work? Uh, write to Catherine Byrne. Mm. <laughs> Send us money. Mm. Catherine Byrne is the Minister for State for Drugs and Alcohol. And yes, she's done a lot for drugs, but she's done nothing for alcohol since she uh, came into the position. Um you know, we're here, we're very open to talking to anybody, we're open to giving a help to anybody that we can, and, um, you know, we will just keep on keeping on, and hopefully at some stage things will shift a little bit, and there may be a little bit of give in terms of funding.